be more interested in the actual slide deck or just going through the food map live, or does it matter? Thank you. We'll open the Zoom at that, the share screen in just a second. Kevin, we are live. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to call to order our November 2nd, 2022 meeting of the City of Charleston Health and, Wild, Health and Wellness Advisory Committee. Um, hope your little ghosts and goblins made it safely around the neighborhood. I know I enjoyed some good costumes and the excitement of Halloween this weekend and this week. And uh, we're coming down the home stretch of 2022. I think we got 23 days till Thanksgiving, 53 days till Christmas. And I know it's a busy time for each of you, and I um, just want to let you know how much the city of Charleston and I appreciate you spending some time um, talking to us about health and wellness topics in our area. We, we know your time's valuable, and we very much appreciate it. Um, Mayor Tecklenburg may be able to join us a little bit later. He had some early morning meetings uh, this morning. He apologized that he couldn't make it, but uh, he's going to try to jump in before we finish. Hopefully he can. So, um I know most of you saw that last Friday, Paul Weeders emailed our agenda for today's meeting, um, along with the minutes of our October 5th meeting. And uh, he also included a PowerPoint slideshow from the American Cancer Society and a link to uh, a statewide interactive GIS map showing where some food pantries are in every county in South Carolina. Uh, to help aid families facing food insecurity. And Nick Osborne also shared a link to an outstanding map that the Lowcountry Food Bank website has um, that will help people in our immediate area and along the coast of South Carolina that need help um, finding food. So thank you for sending that along. And um, I guess if I could, I need to get a motion to accept the minutes for the October 5th meeting. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I make the motion. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, made a motion. Can I have a second? A second. All right, thank you, Maggie. Uh, any deletions, additions, corrections? If not, all in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, the minutes are approved. All right, so now I'd like to call on the Environmental Justice Coordinator for the South Carolina Department of Health Environmental Services Office of Environmental Affairs, Keisha Long. She's going to talk to us about food access mapping. So Keisha, if you would, please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me to discuss the food access map that is part of a project I am working on funded by the EPA. This map has come to fruition and has been a a very, um, it's like a touchstone throughout the state. I've gotten a lot of contacts uh, from people, email and phone calls who are interested, not only in the map, but in adding locations to the map. And yesterday, actually I received an email and it looks like we can get another 400. They're called blessing boxes. Uh, you may have seen them throughout the area and they have a, their own mapping system. So it's very hoping to merge the two and, and just increase access to food for more communities. So I do have a brief slide presentation. So I will share screen here. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. So the pandemic, it has opened a lot of eyes. Uh, there have been disparities throughout time, but the pandemic just made it, made them more obvious. Uh, one of my um, directives from Myra Reese, who is the director of environmental affairs, asked me and uh, several members of environmental affairs team to make sure that environmental justice communities, disadvantaged communities have access to COVID testing and eventually COVID vaccinations. And if you remember back in 2020, testing was hard to come by and there were a lot of restrictions on who could get tested because of the restrictions. So this is just 
a uh, graphic of different projects and um, testing sites that we actually worked on. This was um, at Benedict College. They have a football stadium. Uh, I think it was 2,000 were tested that day. It was uh, a two-day, actually, two-day event. And we also uh, handed out what we call personal protective equipment bags, which included um, mask, masks, hand sanitizer, paper towels. At the time, it was difficult to um, find these items. So EJ Strong, this is the EPA project that I am the manager of. It is community managed disaster risk reduction about empowerment to communities, particularly environmental justice communities. So we're looking at different hazards that could impact the state and our primary nonprofit we're working with is Lampsey. They're in North Charleston. Um, and so we are looking at flooding hazards, chemical releases, also pandemics. How do you plan for these events? How do you respond during the event and how do you build back if there is any damage? We're working on resilience, um, sustainability, and is a central pilot for the region and the country. I wanted to just highlight this. Uh, it's a way, a different way of thinking about risk and who is at risk. And the, the top picture is showing how we typically um, view vulnerability, vulnerability as a condition of who you are, uh, how much money you make, if you're disabled or senior citizen or a, a youth. Uh, this is showing a flooding situation. And there are two houses at the bottom of the hill, one which is considered the poor, poor house and then the rich house. And you can see during this flooding situation, miraculously, the rich house is, is not impacted by the flood, even though they're obviously at the bottom of the hill. So we're shifting the concept of vulnerability to location. You're vulnerable with where you are, not who you are. So physically, the rich house and the poor house are both vulnerable to flood because of where they are. And those further up the hill are not really impacted by flooding. It seems obvious, but uh, some of our processes that we put in place throughout the years are highlight the left picture and not the right picture. So this is just a screenshot of the food map. That's, that's the direct link to the food access map. Clips University is a partner with us on this project, as well as Lampsey, USC, the College of Charleston, and then EPA is the funder. So I'm going to back out of this and go to the actual food map. So this is the live version of the food map. You can get directions uh, to particular places. You can filter based on what you're actually looking for. So there are some organizations that do have, uh, require you to put in an application. Some are focused entirely on senior citizens. Some require you to have a photo ID. So you can toggle the this on and off and you can see some disappear. So these are organizations that organizations that do not require full ID and several disappear. Some who do not require application, again, it looks like about half, well maybe a little more than half, require some sort of application to access anything. Uh, you can click on any one of these marks and get more information. So this is 
I just randomly picked this one. This is the organization is Evening of Prayer. You get the address, the phone number, what services they provide, and then into the information such as do you need an application ID? No. Income restrictions? No. Geared towards seniors? No. And then you have the hours of operation, second and fourth Saturday for the homeless first and third Friday for the neighborhood. They do have some COVID restrictions still in place, and this was updated in April, so that may no longer be the case, but you have the phone number and you can ask if it is still the case. There are different colored marks here. Uh, so the blue are the food access points. Orange, we have the DHEC environmental offices. So they're on uh, McMillan Avenue in North Charleston here. The green is showing the DHEC health offices. So we do have a dual mandate for public health as well as environmental health. And they're on Whipper Barony Lane. And purple are United Way offices. <clears throat> so this one is on Rivers Avenue. Are there any questions before I move on? Thank you, Julie. So, um, and something else that uh, is also a good resource is the USDA food. Uh, is security map, and this is a graphic of the state of South Carolina. The orange um, highlights are showing really where it takes way more effort to get to a grocery store. So this is showing half a mile in the city and 10 miles in rural areas in order to get to a grocery store. Um, and so this is an excellent map to try to see the merger between food scarcity and the food access map. Uh, about six months ago, I was doing this manually because there was no map that showed the two together. Unfortunately, the summer I had an intern who actually did this for me. Um, this is a screenshot of um, the food access map of the green dots and the dark hash marks are showing the food scarcity areas from the USDA. So I'll back out of this and actually go to this tool that he uh, helped to create. And this is actually not live yet. This is still draft final. There are what we call hot buttons at the top. Um, so we go through different layers, uh, your environmental justice layers, we can see opportunity zones, et cetera. But uh, let's look at food and health and food access layers. So this is showing the USDA food insecurity or food um, insecurity areas. This is um, based on the ESRI system. So the USDA actually controls the data. And anytime they update the data, our data gets updated. So I'll add the food resource map to that. And then we have the dots uh, start to appear. And you can see this just go to Centerville. There are a lot of food access points in Centerville, but the actual food scarcity map, according to USDA, it's, it doesn't line up. So immediately I see that as an opportunity to be more efficient to place food access points. Maybe one of these, um, and oftentimes there are churches who have the food pantries. Maybe they are thinking of redoing uh, a food access point or adding a new one. <clears throat> and this will give them you know, some information of 
what actually, where should we put the new place? And these dots are tiny, so you have to click on them. There we go. <laughs> so uh, this is Murray United Methodist Church on um, Orangeburg Road. Um, maybe they're thinking about expanding their um, food pantry. And so they can use this tool eventually when it's published to better site a place. So that's all I had to share. Any questions? Um, Keisha, I have a question for you. Um, how, uh, what is the plan or, or what's the process for ensuring that um, the food access points are maintained and kept up to date? Is there an ongoing partnership or process to make that happen? Yes, Clipsy University committed to continue to update and revise the map, which is a really big, it's, it was really big that they agreed to do this because the grant, it ends eventually. We have one more year, but uh, they do have a email address where the, you can send any points that may be missing or maybe there's some information that's changed and they'll um, update it. They have a lot of interns who have worked on this project and I believe it's probably part of their course of study. So they have a large pipeline of participation and uh, people who are willing to do the work to make sure that the map is fresh and not out of date. Very good. Thank you, Keisha. Great presentation. Uh, let me ask you, so it, it's great, obviously an outstanding tool for people to use. Um, are, how do we get the word out to somebody that does not have a smartphone or computer or that type of thing. What, what kind of things are we doing to get this same type of information out? Thank you for asking that question. That is uh, something that came up during the pandemic. We were very hyper-focused on computers and getting access to different things. Um, so one way we try to rectify that is going to community leaders churches and those who do have this technology and having them be a uh, help them help people who don't have these items navigate the system and as I said earlier a lot of the pantries are actually at churches and churches have announcements and flyers and things of that nature and to get information out so uh, using the networks of the food pantries, the farmers markets, United Way to get the word out and helping people actually access the information. Um, it will be critical. Also, I spoke with actually Duke Energy that's working with 201 and United Way in the upstate. There's a, a text texting platform now where you can actually text uh, to get the information for different food pantries in your area to your phone. So you don't have to go to a website and type in stuff. You can have it sent to your phone, which I think is a fantastic. Yeah, very good. And that's, and that's also available down in our, our low country as well. Um, so the 211 network, it's a it's a just a number that anybody can call um, if they're interested or are or, or looking for food access. I'm going to make sure that this everything that's in this map aligns with the database that we have and vice versa. If there's anything that we have in our 211 database that's not on this map, we'll make sure it's there as well. But yes, any person can call 211 if they're looking for food, they'll get um, uh, pointed in the right direction of who is uh, closest to them. Um, and what the requirements are to utilize that. And then there is a new texting service where you can text the word food to 211, and that will um, bring up the same uh, options as you would get if you called the hotline. Um, Keisha, is there anything that the city of Charleston can do to help or support you in, in, any, in either one of you or Joey um, that maybe we're not doing or maybe that another municipality is doing? I believe the key really is 
to have it multiple access points to this map. Um, Clemson has it, GHEC has it. Um, I'm not sure that there's been a lot of television coverage, so they're, they're on different television websites, but if City of Charleston could at least have a link in, uh, to the map. Also, if you see any errors, please let us know so we can fix those or any additions. Um, as I said earlier, there are several hundred that we could potentially be missing. Uh, we also had uh, a senior resources director send us their list of 140 different locations, some that were on the map, some that weren't. Um, so yes, please not only have the link, but also how to update it um, so that we have a accurate map. Okay, um, Paul? Paul, you're on mute. I don't know if you... A um, couple, of, Keisha, thank you. A couple of questions of, of one, and, and Nick is, with the, the food banks throughout the city or with the, throughout the state, are they tied into this map? Right, the base of the map is from really 211 on the United Way. Uh, it started at the height, the beginning of the pandemic in upstate. So 10 at the top, Clips University and United Way created a food map for the 10 counties in upstate. And it includes you know, the food pantries, or it should, <laughs> um, since they're major big uh, food access locations. And so using 211, the map was expanded to the entire state. So it should incorporate upstate Midlands Harvest Hope as well as the low country locations. But if it doesn't, please let us know so we can make sure they're there. The second question, I, I like the fact that when you were showing that Somerville up there on Orange Grove, Orangeburg Road, of how it was, y'all you know, were talking about if a church wanted to create, expand their thing, it was about more than your location, but go to where the need is. And is that what, that's what it sounds like that y'all y'all are, are doing. And, and then leading in, I'd like to ask Nick how that all works together with what they're doing as well too. Yeah, sure, Paul. Do you want me to pull up the, the site that we have? I can show everyone what we've got. Paul, would you like me to show what we have? Yes, please. Yeah, sure. No, I, this is great. And, and Keisha, thank you so much. And Joey, thanks very much indeed. And I think um, uh, the more information that's out there for people in terms of being able to find out where they can access food, the better. And, and obviously the, the, the consistency and the, the making sure that uh, we're able to keep this updated on a regular basis is going to be, I think, one of the, the important points moving forward. But if I can just show very quickly... Um, what we have, which I think is very complimentary. Can everyone see that? Yeah, we can yes. see it now. Yeah. Now, yes. Yeah, good. So again, as, as I shared the link, I mean, on our website, um, again, if you go onto our website at, at lowcountryfoodbank.org, or if anyone goes on there, they can use this as a very convenient way to find uh, where a pantry is closest to, to where they are, are living. So just by clicking on the, the, the food pantry, um, tab and you can see very similar to, to what Keisha shared, a very similar map in terms of, of where all the locations of um, pantries are located in terms of where anyone can go to to get access to uh, food. So for example, um, if to zoom in there, if you were to type in um, the zip code there, so let, let's just type in 29405. This was working, apologies for this. So we can see all of the, the, the listed um, 
food pantries that are closest to the address that, that I've just typed in there. And anyone can go there. And similar to what Keisha had said, there, there are phone numbers there, there's distances to where it is. Uh, and I think as Keisha mentioned as well, what the important point is, is always to, to, to phone or, or contact in advance to make sure that, that the food pantry is, is open uh, at any particular time. But again, this, this, this is all over our 10 county um, service area. It doesn't obviously cover um, the whole of the, the state of Carolina. But again, all of the pantries are, are listed here. And Keisha, I think one of the challenges here is going to be making sure that there is consistency. And I think there is certainly on what I've looked at so far. But again, how do we keep in touch to make sure that when pantries are either closing down or opening to make sure that that is kept up to date? Uh, and again, as part of this, we also um, have the, the the reference to uh, United Way as well in terms of seeking um, seeking assistance. In addition to this as well, if you if you click on the, the site here, food distribution calendar, you can also see where to access um, other options for being able to access food. So these are the events that are, are hosted by different partners, uh, whether that be at schools for our mobile distributions, for fresh expresses. So again, the, these are um, somewhere where you can go on, someone can go onto the site here and find where there is a particular access on a particular day that's not necessarily just at a food pantry, but is also set up for um, a mobile distribution um, at any point in time. Um, and again, you can you can look at that. It's a calendar. You could put in whatever date. Um, so in this case, I'm just clicking on the 11th of, of November. And again, you can see what is scheduled um, on the 11th of November um, in terms of, of, of distributions or access to food that, that's not from a pantry, but, but is from, um, as I said, an alternative uh, mode of distribution, whether that be, as I said, through a, a mobile pantry, a, a fresh express or, or other form of, of distribution to be able to provide access to people that need food at any point in time. So I think this is very complementary and very supportive of what, what uh, Keisha has and also working with uh, United Way as well. And again, this is, we've designed this and this has been designed in a way that um, from a website perspective, design can also be accessed on a computer, but also is very mobile friendly as well. So you can ac access this and you can view this very uh, easily on, on a mobile device as well. Nick, is the common link that somebody doesn't have access through a phone or IT is the 211 number for both, for, for, for y'all as well too? Correct, yes. Or, or phoning, um, phoning us here in, in our facility here as well um, to get access as well, to find if someone doesn't have access, they can phone here and we can talk to those in, that individual and provide them with uh, information as to where to get at, where they can get access. But the 211 is the most convenient way to go. Very good. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. Um, Kevin, one more question for, for both Nick and Keisha. The, the areas that are inside the city of Charleston, like we've got in 29407 and down in the peninsula 29403 area, the, the show food deserts on the USDA, do, do y'all, Nick, when y'all, or I know Keisha was talking about when churches or other groups call, are those areas identified um, for trying to figure out how do we get access to, to food areas? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we're obviously we work with close to around about 250 different partner agencies across our service areas, and we're continually updating or, or receiving applications for um, for pantries that want to partner with us. And one of the things that we do is we're using the data that we have and the mapping to identify where those food deserts are. Um, to ensure that that we're we're looking at working with partners that can best serve those food deserts as well. In addition to that, when we're also looking at alternative ways of getting food out to people that where there aren't any partner agencies or pantries, uh, with, that's how we program where we do our mobile distributions or where we do our our, um, our other options that that are more 
um, focused on, on getting food out on, on a particular distribution, doing drive-through distribution. So we're looking at different methodologies to be able to focus on those, those where the gaps are, uh, especially where there aren't pantries available in, in a particular area. And I guess asking the same question Kevin asked for with the Low Country Food Bank, is it the best thing for us to put in our newsletters or or social media would be what would what's the best for both of y'all that we could do the mapping or the two one one or what, what what would you be best to help kept consistent with your messaging? I mean, I would certainly appreciate any. Um any messaging that, that gives people the, 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 um, the information as to where they can go to get what is necessary for them to be able to access um, where food pantries are. So uh, a communication into which, what link to um, click on to be able to get access. Um, so anything related to that would be very helpful um, so that people know where to go, they can get the necessary information and then they can follow up and get the access to the food that they need. Good. Whatever you can supply me, I'll make sure we, we put it out there for you. That'd be great. Thank you, Nick um, and Keisha and Joey. Thank you for, for all of that great information. We really appreciate it. Anything further before we any, anything on this before we move forward? Well, thank you all very much. A lot of great information and um, we really appreciate you um, um, participating today and, and letting us know what you have there. Thank you very much. Great tools. So, um, I know um, I know Maggie Dangerfield has um, a busy day with Charleston County Schools. She's probably got to slip out a little bit early. I did. I wanted to give her an opportunity to present anything she has from Charleston County Schools. So, Maggie, if you would. Thank you so much, Councilman Sheely. Um, we are um, going to send out some messaging to our families this week um, about flu season and the importance of um, getting your flu vaccination since they're um, predicted to have a severe flu season. Um, <clears throat> DHEC will be offering flu vaccines at our Title I middle and high schools from December 5th through the 9th. Um, and then our nursing services department will be providing school-based flu clinics at our Title I elementary schools starting in November. So we will have um, those opportunities available at those schools. Um, and then we en encourage everyone else to um, schedule their flu vaccination at a local pharmacy or their healthcare provider just to have that extra level of protection as we move into that season. Um, some current work going on in the district. Um, our, our board and our superintendent and staff have been engaged in the development of uh, goals and guardrails in support of our vision 2027 of all students reading on grade level by grade five. Um, <clears throat> this work is culminating shortly, but uh, they have worked to develop specific goals for literacy, math, and college and career readiness, um, and then interim goals along the way, kind of checkpoints for certain subgroups of students that they'll look at um, throughout the next three to five years to see where we are in terms of making progress. And additionally, they've developed some guard role, uh, guardrails, which are <clears throat> non-negotiable um, values and priorities that we'll honor along the way, things that we won't compromise in our goals and or in our mission to achieve our goals and our objectives. Um, it's really robust work. It's very detailed work. Um, <clears throat> it's available on our website if you go to our homepage and under our important links, uh, I believe it is titled, let me just not misspeak here, uh, CCSD BOT Student Outcomes Focused Governance. Uh, and that has everything um, that's occurred throughout the entire process, um, dating back to the board's community engagement that began in September, that was kind of the kickoff point, launch point for the development of these goals and guardrails. So we're really excited for that work. Um, and that, you know, has been a, a big focus um, of, of our time and efforts to have those solidified so that we are laying a great foundation and groundwork um, to ensure that all of our students are achieving being able to read on grade level by grade five by 2027. All right. Well, thank you, Maggie. Appreciate that. Um, anyone have any questions for Maggie with Charleston County Schools? Thank you very much for letting me bump you up in the agenda there and uh, and giving us that. So thank you. So I greatly much. appreciate it. Thank you. All right.
Thank you. All right, so um, we will um, move forward now. Um, I think most of you know Joey Current, the uh, health program manager for Trident United Way, and um, he's going to give us a uh, update on the community garden initiative. Thanks so much, Councilman Sheely. Um, so. Uh, as folks saw earlier, you know, there are lots of great resources out there helping us see where there is the biggest need for uh, for food and where we see the, the highest rates of food insecurity and what many organizations are doing to try to help um, um, to help with that uh, effort. And so trying to United Way is doing the same thing. We're looking at these maps. We're looking at where resources uh, exist and where they don't exist. Um, and we recognize that one strategy uh, that can be very helpful to help um, prevent food insecurity is to help establish community gardens. Um, community gardens are a great way for community members to not only come together uh, and have a, um, a shared project where they're uh, growing food, learning where their food comes from, um, and then providing that food out to community members uh, for free. And so we um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Just this is just the the highlight. So essentially what we're doing is we're going to support um, the development, the building and the um, sustained uh, use of community gardens. Um, it's a two year project. We're picking one uh, group uh, in Charleston, Dorchester and Berkeley counties to provide all of the supplies stipends, support, expertise needed to get a community garden off the ground. Um, and we're gonna do that in partnership with Clemson Extension, uh, who are the master gardeners, the folks who, who know the most about how um, our soil works and what, what can be grown and what types of year and all the things needed to, to get those gardens going. Um, we're also going to be, um, putting together a community garden support team. So these aren't folks uh, who are awarded the community garden. Um, these are folks who are uh, passionate about community gardens, who know a lot about it, who are from our communities um, that want to help support these groups uh, as they plan um, and, and then build and then sustain these gardens in our area. So uh, we're putting together a community garden team to provide that support and that community voice. That's so important. And then we're going to provide all the supplies and things needed, as well as expertise and training uh, to three groups uh, in our area. The applications are open now and they're um, available on our website, which I'll post in the chat. Um, and uh, those applications are open until December 9th. So between now and December 9th, anybody you know, uh, I'm specifically not saying uh, organizations, I'm saying groups, because there could be some community groups, there could be some neighborhood groups, there could be some great uh, um, um, community folks out there who recognize the need um, and would like to start a community garden, and they're welcome to apply as well. Now, the big things that are needed, just as a quick reminder, uh, we need to make sure we have obviously space to be able to um, install a community garden. We're gonna put in about five raised beds um, to start. And we wanna make sure that those spaces um, certainly have uh, access to plenty of sunlight, uh, are close to a water source. Uh, and we would really want to uh, prioritize those areas that are, you know, overlap the maps that we saw this morning uh, in terms of where we see food deserts that already exist, where we see low access to food and what is accessible to the community um, itself. So um, for anybody who's interested, I'll put that link in the chat, but this is one way that we're trying to help um, address this food insecurity issue that we're seeing. So thank you for your time. Um, and if anybody has any questions, happy to answer those. But we also have a great FAQ on our website uh, for anybody who wants to know inform more information. Okay, Paul. Joey, the, the link to register on Try to Unite Away, where would they go? Yep, putting that in the chat right now, Paul. But I'm mean, for anybody listening in. Yes, for anybody listening in, it's um, tuw.org backslash community garden and that web page uh has all the information it has um information session that we recorded with all the answers folks may um need and uh, faq and then there's a big link that says um application uh available so um we would encourage folks to spread the message spread the word that we're providing this uh to the community and encourage folks to apply if they think they are a good fit 
And one last question, those areas that are hurting in, in foods insecurity areas, are, do they get any priority in this selection process? There's, they certainly will be um, prioritized in terms of the selection. Yes, we are going to put together a selection team. We're going to have criteria, um, and certainly we're going to want to emphasize those areas that are um, in food deserts and have low access uh, and low income areas uh, to be able to get food and fruits and vegetables. Thank you. Hey. Hey, Joey, this is Quentin from MUSC. Uh, perhaps I missed it, and forgive me if I, if I did and I'm having you repeat something. Has there been any targeted promotions within communities that we know uh, could benefit from this? That's a great question. So we had two uh, general information sessions uh, that we hosted and have been recorded uh, in our, on our webpage, um, and we sent out the um, invitation to register for those info sessions uh, across many of our, our nonprofit and community um, networks here at Trident United Way. That doesn't mean that uh, it, we're going to stop there. We're certainly going to be looking into targeted um, uh, invitations to apply for this. So yes, uh, we certainly will be reaching out to those areas that we know uh, would be um, great candidates uh, and see if there are any community groups who are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Um, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg, thank you for joining us. I let them know earlier that, uh, that that you may be a little bit late, that you had a busy early morning, but thank you for joining us, Mr. Mayor. Well, well, well thank you, uh, Council Member, and thank you, everybody. Um, we were out supporting the Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy. Uh, Jennifer and I were this morning, and they, um, they do an incredible job in our community. Uh, Joey, I was going to mention it. Um, it looks you're just limiting this to three um, three gardens at this point. Is that correct? That's right. We're starting with three, um, but who knows uh, how far we can go um, once we get this started. So, so will you stay in touch with Paul? If y'all get some other applicants in the city um, that that um, we could help support. I mean, I'd I'd like to you know get more gardens, but. We're partnering, as you know, with uh, Charleston Parks Conservancy and with Greenheart and um, probably some others. Um, we, we help establish that big plot at the uh, Instant Homes with Greenheart um, and with Charleston Parks Conservancy, West Ashley. We, we plan to add another community garden on the Greenway. I don't think it qualifies in terms of um, the map um, that I just missed seeing, but I'm sure I can look it up. But in other words, uh, we have some other partners and resources that if you get like five or six good applications from, from groups wanting to do gardens, I'd like to try to do everything we can to, to, to help, help more than one. <laughs> I think the more the merrier. Absolutely. As, as, as funding and resources are available, we will certainly do that. That'd be great. Awesome. We'll, we'll try to help as well. Joey, when you're looking for a spot to put this, I mean, th could this be private land? Does it need to be a common area? Um, what type of uh, property are we are we looking for to be eligible for this? Yeah, the only the only requirements we have uh, are that we have permission uh, from whoever owns the land to use it. So if that's private land, if the private landowner gives permission, that's great. And if it's public land, uh, municipality or whoever owns that land gives permission, um, we're good to go. And the you know the understanding would be that this is at least. Um, um, some, well, this is something that we want to be sustained. So we don't want this to be built and then in a year or two, uh, you know, go dead or, or not be used. So that, that's really our only requirement there. Okay. And I know you were talking about a certain number of boxes. Is there a minimum or amount of space? Uh, most, most average raised beds are about four feet by four feet. And we're trying to put about five of those in place. Um, so if that helps, uh, you know, visualize about how much space you need. Um, but of course, you know, if you have uh, room to expand, and I'm sure that, you know, as community needs arise and there's, there may be a need to expand it later, um, that's certainly going to be helpful and something that I would encourage folks to, um, write about in their application. Okay, great. Any other questions for Joey on this garden initiative? Well, thank you so much, Joey. Great information. We appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. We will uh, 
move on. A lot of you have uh, seen that there's a good article in the paper about flu season and the early effects. And uh, I'm going to call on Dr. Katie Richardson, who will probably touch on that as well as many other things. So Dr. Richardson, if you would, please. Absolutely. And yes, you're exactly right. I want to kick off by uh, talking about the respiratory viruses that I think we all know have hit us hard um, and early this season. Those include um, flu as well as RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and the article in the paper today um, does quote um, Allison Eckerd, uh, an infectious disease physician at MUSC, uh, talking about that the Children's Hospital is uh, nearing capacity um, with very young children often um, who have RSV and are beginning also to present um, with flu and needing hospitalization. Um, they are still able to take care of the kids that need to, to be um, hospitalized um, and need um, the care that is available um, in our community for children. Um, but if we can all do our parts um, by getting vaccinated um, against the two vaccine preventable um, infections, um, that's COVID and um, flu, um, those help to prevent hospitalizations and deaths, both in children um, and adults. Um, RSV does not yet have a vaccine um, that prevents it, but the same preventive measures that we use um, to decrease the transmission of flu and COVID in our communities um, also helps to prevent um, the transmission of RSV, especially in those um, kids that are young and are unable to be vaccinated yet against um, flu and, um, and COVID. Um, so we are at widespread flu activity and have been for much of this month. That's the first time in over eight years that we've seen flu at this level um, this early in the season. So whereas um, in previous years, um, some wanted to wait um, into um, November or maybe even December to get the flu vaccine, that is not um, the um, the best decision for this year because we're really seeing um, continued increases every week, um, both in um, hospitalizations. We just had our first pediatric death. Um, we've had um, a flu death in adults as well in the um, in the low country. Um, and with a um, vaccine preventable disease, um, we certainly um, want to see our communities do what they can um, to prevent um, that happening. Over half. We've seen over half of all um, our numbers this year are already over half of what they were for the entire season through the spring um, with flu uh, last year. We also saw over a 17% increase in our COVID numbers um, in the low country over the last um, week. So for anyone putting off their bivalent booster um, for COVID, um, now is the time um, to get that as well as the flu vaccine. They can be given at the same time. Um, and in addition to respiratory viruses, I also wanted to touch on an initiative that is being sponsored by the Fast Track Cities Initiative to end um, the HIV epidemic. This will be occurring at the end of January. Um, it is entitled a National Dialogue Series on the Intersection of Racism and HIV as a Public Health Crisis. And the Fast Track Cities worldwide are sponsoring these dialogues across um, the U.S. Uh, and they will then inform um, a national report um, on, um, on this topic. So um, I will look to you and ask you to please um, provide Paul or myself um, with recommendations for panelists uh, for this uh, Charleston Dialogue. The names of the panels include housing, quality of care, income inequality, behavioral health, provider gap, and stigma discrimination. So once we um, sort of hammer out a date, um, we'll be um, looking to reach out um, to populate um, panels um, for this virtual event um, and, uh, and hope that you will um, consider um, participating um, as well as giving us recommendations um, for people to, uh, to speak to that issue. 
Um, thanks for the time as always, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Dr. Richardson? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'll um, just ask Jennifer Roberts if she has anything. Thank you for joining us and for being with the Coastal Chaplaincy this morning as well. Well, thank you. Yeah, I am um, glad I got to do both. We had a really nice breakfast and it always warms my heart. Is those Coastal Crisis Chaplaincy is such a great organization and they help so many folks. Jennifer, um, before you get started, may I ask a quick question of Dr. Richardson? Sure. This is, sorry, it's Carolyn. I apologize. Just a real quick Wondering if you're noticing any concentrations, any areas where you're seeing flu more prevalent, whether in adults or children. Thank you for that question, Carolyn. Um, we are seeing um, increased rates of influenza-like illness um, in children. Uh, and that is traditionally the case. Um, we often see um, children in daycare and um, schools um, contracting flu um, in those locations and then bringing it home um, to, um, to family members, including um, those who might be um, more at risk. And so um, definitely younger children, but we're also seeing, uh, we're really seeing it across the board. Um, but our numbers usually, and this continues now, to be um, highest in, uh, in children. Um, I say children really from zero to the age of 24. Um, and, um, and our youngest children, as well as our oldest adults, and those who may um, have other chronic medical conditions are those that we are seeing the most severe effects. And that is, um, that's similar to previous years. Thank you. And any particular locations coming from any concentrated areas? Um, I, I don't, I mean, it's certainly we're seeing the most outbreaks in schools now. Um, any school with 20% or more um, of a particular group, a classroom or a sports team are reportable um, to DHAC as an outbreak. Uh, and we are um, at this point still seeing the majority of our outbreaks um, from our schools, um, not yet as many from our um, long-term uh, care facilities, but, um, but certainly we are concerned um, that often the flu does move as I said, from uh, from children to uh, to older adults. So um, so now is the time for everyone to get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Jennifer, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for jumping in, Carolyn. I apologize if I missed you. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, we had a staff member yesterday that was trying to get into health first. She had the flu and it they were on an almost four hour wait and then they were eventually turning people away and saying, find another provider. <laughs> so yeah, it's bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just gonna give a quick update on 988. Um, we're still uh, proceeding to be the second 988 call center in the state to back up Mental Health America in Greenville. Um, it's probably gonna take us a little longer to get our building than we were hoping. So we're trying to be creative and hire staff here and have them trained in Greenville and have them work uh, remotely from Charleston kind of for the Greenbelt 988 so that we can help them answer calls because calls are increasing across the nation um, since the 988 number came out, um, which is good. Um, but we still have our mobile crisis call center here too. So um, please remind people to please call us. We are here 24 seven to try to help folks. Um, the other thing is uh, social services hub had the ribbon cutting last month and I, I think we're still on for November 18th, I think is the date uh, when Day Otis Charleston Center and, and the Crisis Stabilization Unit will all move in um, on Rivers Avenue. So that's exciting. And uh, we did get to take a tour of the, the finished building. And let me tell you, it's beautiful. Um, the, the people in the community that are seeing DSS and everyone else, it's um, it's just a step up. I mean, it, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful place to get social services, and it, it just makes makes me happy that um, they'll have such a beautiful building to go to, and and it's just really refreshing. Like DSS, the colors are bright, everything's nice. It just everything seems much more welcoming, and um, really exciting that that building's opening soon. Um, and other than that, we're just still hiring. 
still need counselors. We're still short staffed. Um, we're doing our best. Um, we're hoping to have some good news soon with some, some salary increases so that we can um, have a little easier time hiring. But um, you know, if you need anything, something goes wrong, just please reach out to me. Um, we are doing our best. Our executive team are, is working overnight shifts that are three overnight programs and going out on mobile crisis calls that they don't usually go out on, but uh, but we're hanging in and we appreciate everybody and just let me know if anyone needs anything. Very good. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Jennifer Roberts? Um, well, thank you for all that you and your team do. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, and um, Quentin, not to put you on the spot, just didn't know if you had anything from MUSC that you wanted to uh, mention or report out. Uh, I think it's pretty much been said, uh, just dealing with flu, RSV, um, and uh, COVID cases. Um, you know, again, just to echo what everyone is saying, uh, make sure that we get our kids and ourselves vaccinated. Uh, our after hours care for our peeps are, have been overwhelmed in the past uh, several weeks. I actually had to go there. Uh, the other night for my teenager and the place was packed. I mean, but our team is doing a great job of just getting folks in and out of there as quickly as possible. But uh, it was evident that we are in the midst of a, a, a crisis here with our flu season and, and the, all, the, all the other respiratory uh, uh, conditions. So I would just echo what Dr. Richardson has stated already. Uh, but other than that, we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate what you do over there, too. So thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Anything else to come before this committee? Well, I want to thank you all for your time. I know how valuable your time is, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, it was a good meeting. Um, got a lot out of this meeting and a lot of information, and we all got it in within an hour. So great job. And uh, I appreciate it. Um, there's nothing else. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you. Be healthy. <laughs>